A gang storms a bank. The bank customers and employees were taken as hostages. The police surrounded the area, and after long negotiations with the gang, the police command decided to storm the place. But when the police entered the bank, an unexpected surprise awaited them. The gang members disappeared without any trace, even though the police surrounded the bank on all sides. So where did they go? The events of our story took place in the city of Berlin, the capital of Germany, at 10 o'clock a.m. on the 27th of June in the year 1995. The Berlin police moved towards one of the banks in the city in response to a theft alarm that was launched from the bank. The police surrounded the place to discover that there were 16 people, employees, and customers who were taken as hostages inside the bank by three armed men. These men were wearing masks on their faces. They were armed with machine guns, pistols, grenades, and more heavy weapons. German special forces arrived to deal with the situation. Snipers climbed onto the roofs of nearby buildings. The bank was surrounded from every direction. The media also arrived at the scene and started covering the events. The news was spread all over the country. The whole area has been closed off to civilians or any unauthorized person. The police and the authorities have established a direct line of communication with the bank to communicate with the gang and find out their demands. 30 minutes later, the gunman released one of the hostages with a letter. The militants say in this letter that they are asking for $12 million. The letter also contained a warning that any attempt to storm the bank would lead to the hostages being shot and then a direct firefight with the police. The police wanted to negotiate with the gunman. They want them to release some hostages before giving them money. The police tried to communicate with them and they tried to call them, but the gunman refused to talk. The gunman stopped all communication lines with the police for five hours without any news and the police were waiting without doing anything. Finally, at six o'clock in the evening, the silence was broken. One of the hostages, a young mother, was forced to call a local radio station in Berlin and she began begging for help. This call was a very clever move by the gunman. People became more sympathetic and worried about the hostages after hearing the voice of this mother begging for her life. Therefore, this move put a lot of pressure on the police and the authorities to bring the money and hand it over to the militants as soon as possible. But despite all this, the police refused and remained to besiege the bank without responding to the gunman's demands. On the other hand, the gang also refused to speak with the police negotiators. The police were surprised. Why does this gang refuse to talk to them directly? Why do they let the hostages call the radio? Anyway, the police didn't do anything, but after a while, the gunmen declared their impatience when a gunshot was heard coming from inside the bank. The police didn't know what happened, but they believed that the gunman shot someone from the hostages. The police command was discussing all possible ways to deal with the situation. They even thought that they would bring an armored truck and storm the bank, but before they could do anything, the armed men moved before them. One of the masked men came out in front of the bank with a hostage and shouted at the police and media cameras. He said that they will start shooting the hostages one by one if the police did not respond to their demands. This movement has increased the pressure on the police and the authorities in a terrible way. The police authorities then tried to settle a strategic move. They brought a third of the ransom, which was demanded by the militants. It was about $4 million in order to show the militants their good intention about resolving the situation. At 7 and a half p.m., this money was delivered to the militants by one of the police officers, wearing only underwear to prove that he did not carry any weapons with him. After that, the gunmen cut off their contacts. The police kept waiting in their place for two and a half hours without any news. They did not know what the gunmen were making inside the bank. Then, finally, the gunman called the police from the bank's phone. The gunman, who was on the phone, asked the police to bring a bus for them in front of the bank and put the remaining amount of the ransom inside this bus. The police agreed to the gunman's demands, and at midnight, everything they asked for was prepared. The bus was in front of the bank, and the rest of the ransom was inside it. Moreover, the police prepared a helicopter and it was waiting for them in the place they had determined. The gunman reached the police 
and told them that they would get out of the bank to the bus at 2 a.m. At 2 o'clock a.m., nothing happened meaning they are still inside, so the police kept waiting and waiting in front of the bank for an hour and a half, and at 3.30 a.m., the police received a new call from the bank. This time, the caller was not one of the gunmen, but the call was from the bank director. He told the police that all the gunmen went down to the basement, and they didn't appear again. The police immediately gave an order to the special forces to storm the bank. They entered and calmed the ground floor and got the hostages out, all of whom were in good condition, and none of them were harmed. So after that, the special forces officers went downstairs to the basement of the bank. And after calming the basement floor, they did not find anybody there. Then they realized that the only place where the gunman could be was the bank vault itself. They besieged the treasury door from the right and the left, opened it a little. The police threw inside a flash bomb and then stormed the treasury. Surprisingly, there was no one in the treasury. The treasury was looted. More than 200 safety deposit boxes were opened and their contents were stolen. Valuable sums and jewelry worth millions. The gang disappeared from the bank completely without any trace even though the police were besieging the place from all directions. So, where did they go? This operation is considered by many to be the smartest bank robbery in history. The planner and the mastermind of the operation was just a technician in a hospital, and he got fired from his job due to some problems. Therefore, he became jobless, and none wanted to recruit him again. And because of that, he decided to plan this operation and carry it out with a group of his friends and acquaintances. So how can a technician in a hospital turn into an armed bank robber? How could he and his friends steal money and jewelry worth more than $12 million and suddenly disappear? The protagonist of our story is a Syrian man called Khalid al-Barazi. He left his country and arrived in Germany in the year 1986, aiming for a better life. He got a job in a hospital unit as an assistant X-ray technician but his expectations for a better life in Germany were not fulfilled, and his income was insufficient for him. Since that time, Khaled entered into the crime and thefts world. He started stealing medicine and equipment from the hospital, and after that, he started to develop his crimes. He started drug trafficking, but the police arrested him soon after. He spent two years in prison from the year 1991 to the year 1993, and in the prison, he met another person who had the same origins named Ergamibrium, and they became friends, and from that time when they were in prison, they were planning for the biggest bank robbery in the history of Germany. And after they get out from the prison, they started looking along the banks of Berlin to find the right target. Khaled had a brother named Tony, who had a car workshop in an upscale neighborhood. Khaled started searching in the area where his brother's workshop was, and after searching, the appropriate goal was found. The target was one of the branches of Commerce Bank. Khaled dressed up nicely and pretended to be a customer. He went to the bank and asked about their service for keeping valuable items safe. One of the employees showed him the safety boxes in the safe, which were in the basement. Khaled salivated when he saw hundreds of safety deposit boxes. He knew that inside these boxes were valuable treasures. And after that, Khaled met up with his friend Ibrahim, and the two of them started making plans for the heist. They could find plans for the bank building in the public archives of the city. This building was a clothing store before becoming a bank. Due to these plans, Khaled knew that the floor in the basement was thin, so he decided to dig a tunnel under the ground. It was easy to do this because Berlin has a lot of sand. The ground wasn't hard or rocky, and digging in the sand won't be too hard either. So now they know how to get into the bank basement. The second thing they need is to find a place to start digging. They looked around and found an empty garage near the bank. This garage was about 200 meters from the bank. Caleb met the owner of the garage and told him he was a Greek merchant who needed to rent the garage to store his merchandise, and they came to an agreement on renting price. The next step was to find a team to work with them on this operation. The first person they recruited with them was Khaled's brother Tony, who owned the car workshop near the bank. 
Ibrahim got the rest of the gang together because he knew more people who might be ready to settle such operations. He brought two people from Berlin's Arab community and convinced them to join them. Thus, their number became five in total. And in June of the year 1994, these five started to work on digging the tunnel from the garage. There were two phases in this operation. First, the sand has to be dug out, and then the sand has to be taken out of the tunnel. And to keep the tunnel from falling down, they used more than three tons of wood and metal, including the support structure for the tunnel that keeps it from collapsing. They also put in pipes, a ventilation system, and tens of meters of cables to provide electricity to the tunnel. Drilling was going on daily, no shifts. They worked about 12 to 14 hours each day, continuous work digging this tunnel without stopping every time two or three of them held the shift. Khaled and his team dug this tunnel for about 12 to 14 hours every day without stopping. They worked nonstop for five months, but they only got a third of the way to the bank. However, Khaled's plan had a very clever way to get there faster. Khaled wasn't digging the tunnel straight to the bank. Instead, he was digging toward a water drainage pipe that is used during storms and heavy rains. This pipe extends along the street to a place near the bank. It only took them five months to reach this pipeline. Indeed, Khaled and his companions crossed the pipeline and reached the part near the bank. And again, they started to dig another tunnel from the pipe to the treasury. The process was more difficult this time than the previous tunnel because they needed to throw the dirt outside the tunnel and the distance was too far to return to the garage. The excavation process this time was very slow, and they continued on it for several months. But one day, something unexpected happened. Khaled saw some workers working in front of the bank, right above where they were digging the tunnel. These people were doing maintenance of the cables right above the tunnel. Khaled and his friends had to pull the supports out of this part of the tunnel and let it fall because the workers digging above would find it. Therefore, all the plans will fail. Khaled decided that they would stop digging until the workers above the tunnel finished their work, which took four months. However, they were lucky that the workers didn't find them. After that, Khaled's team went back to work after five months of stopping, and they continued the digging process toward the bank's treasury. Finally, after about a year, they managed to reach the bank's safe. Many thieves, if they were in Khaled's place, would sneak into the treasury through the secret tunnel at night on the weekend so they would have time and they could steal everything and get out. But this bank had always on surveillance cameras and alarm systems, so there was a high probability that they would be caught while executing the operation. Khaled needed a way to distract the police from them. The crazy idea that came up to his mind was that they should do the operation in a way that the police will never think of. On the morning of June 27, 1995, Khaled, along with his brother Tony and his friend Ibrahim, stormed the bank from the front door, armed with weapons, and took all the people who were present in the bank as hostages. After that, Khaled and his brother Tony began to supervise the negotiation process and the management of the hostages. As for their friend, Ibrahim, he went to the basement and entered the bank's treasury and started digging in the ground to open a hole. Through this hole, the two remaining members of the team who were present underground in the tunnel entered with their drilling machines and tools, and they began using these tools to break the locks of the safe deposit boxes and open them. The police arrived at the bank, and Khaled sent one of the hostages with a message containing the ransom amount, after which he cut off contact with the police for five hours. This hostage Khaled released, the main objective of which was to distract the police and to get more time because, during these five hours, the gang was working on opening and emptying the safe boxes in the treasury. Inside these boxes, they found gold and jewelry, and they were putting everything in bags. After that, they used a sled into the tunnel to reach the garage quickly. Khaled on the other side continued to deal with the police. One of the smartest things he did he let one of the hostages speaks to people and communicates her voice through one of the radio stations. This movement put a lot of pressure on the authorities, and then Khaled fired two bullets at the ceiling in order to deceive the police. 
The police really thought that the gunmen started shooting the hostages, and this put more pressure on them. And after that, they handed over a third of the ransom to the gang. They handed over $4 million to the gunman, Khaled, and his gang after they finished opening all the safety deposit boxes. They asked the police for a bus and a helicopter. The last communication between them and the police was at midnight. After that, the gang descended from the opening in the floor of the treasury and made their way through the tunnel until they reached the garage. The police were besieging the bank from every direction, and while they were waiting for them to get out, the gang crossed under them. When Khalid and his gang arrived at the garage, they left the place immediately with a lot of money and jewelry worth more than $12 million. After this daring operation, the special forces stormed the bank. It didn't take long for the police to discover the tunnel and reach the garage, but the thieves had left no traces behind them. Khaled and his gang went to their homes and started watching the news of their operation on TV. Khaled was confident that the operation was successful and he was sure that they didn't leave any evidence behind them. So he told his companions to remain in Berlin and continue their daily lives and activities normally without arousing suspicion. The police formed a special investigation unit that includes 60 investigators. This unit began to search and investigate operations along the way. The first task was to examine the bank, but they found nothing, no fingerprints, nor any trace of DNA belonging to the militants. Investigators also talked to the hostages and asked them for any information that could help them find the people who did this. The only useful information they got is that the gunmen might be Arabs based on their accents. The investigators turned right away to the garage's owner and they reached him. He told them that he rented his garage to a Greek man who claimed to be a merchant, and this is all that he knew about him. Investigators kept looking for any sign or clue and they got lucky when a construction worker from a nearby building told them that he saw three people with Arabic faces throwing sand at the building where he was working. Therefore, the investigators went to the place and took a small quantity of this sand and sent it to the lab. Tests showed that this sand was the same as the sand in the tunnel. This means that the two men who were throwing sand at the building site were the culprits. And based on the description of the construction worker, the police drew rough sketches of these guys. These sketches were published in newspapers and television stations. A few days later, the police received a call from someone saying that there was a person working in a car workshop near the bank, and this person had similar facial features to one of the men in the sketches. This person was Tony Alberezzi, Kellett's brother. The police went to Tony's workshop, and they started asking questions. But Tony kept confirming that he did not know anything about the robbery or about the people who could have been involved in the operation. The police didn't believe him. On the contrary, their suspicions increased. And one of the policemen took a box of juice that Tony was drinking from. Through this juice box, they were able to take his fingerprints. Moreover, they checked for his name in their database. It appeared that he had a brother named Khaled Al-Barazi who was imprisoned a few years ago on the background of several criminal charges. From this point on, the police began to focus their investigations on Tony and his brother Khaled. They were the main suspects, but they didn't have sufficient evidence to arrest them. Meanwhile, the authorities called the army to make more research into the tunnel and dismantle everything in it. Before this dismantling process, they surveyed the entire tunnel in an attempt to obtain any trace that would lead them to the perpetrators. But all their efforts failed and nothing happened. The army came and dismantled the tunnel. They used advanced infrared scanning techniques. Every piece of wood that came out of the tunnel was scanned. And finally, they were able to obtain a piece of evidence. They obtained a fingerprint found on a unit of wood planks. This fingerprint was the only evidence the investigators got but it was enough evidence. This imprint was the imprint of Tony Albarazzi. After this discovery, Tony was arrested and entered the interrogation room. The investigators continued to investigate him for seven hours. During this investigation, Tony was very confused and tense, so they kept pressuring him until he began confessing to the investigators and he told them everything about all his comrades. 
led by his brother, the policemen moved to arrest the rest of the gang, and they managed to arrest Khaled and Durgham before fleeing the city. And the remaining two members of the gang, they all got arrested and confessed that they were guilty. After the trial, they were given prison sentences ranging from five to 10 years, except for Khaled. A 14-year prison sentence was given because he was the mastermind of the operation. Khaled had the opportunity to escape immediately after the operation, but he chooses to stay in Berlin because he was confident that they did not leave any trace through which the police could follow them. Confidence and ego were the reason for his fall in the end. But although the entire gang was arrested, several million of the money they stole was not recovered. The authorities were able to recover a third of the amount, but that means that there are about $8 million left. They didn't know where it went. Khaled was the only one who knew where the rest of the money was, and Khaled refused to speak. He was supposed to have been released from prison in the year 2010, and it is certain that this money was waiting for him in a safe place after he got out of prison. The investigators offered Khaled to reduce his prison sentence in return for revealing the whereabouts of the money, but he refused. It is true that he got imprisonment for 14 years is a long time, but in the end, when he gets out, a comfortable life will await him. He will become rich, the thing he had dreamed of all his life since he came to Germany. And here we come to the end of our story. Do not forget to like, subscribe to the channel, activate the bell button, and goodbye.